All right. So let's finish up just a small bit um, uh, related to our dynamic problems, which we'll, we'll extend and talk a little bit more on Monday. So I want to imagine what if I extended this for an infinite period of times, time periods. Beta squared, natural log of C3, cubed, natural log of C4. So obviously I could keep going for some time. Right, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So just if you're curious, by the way, I wanted to write this in compact form, I would take the, the sum from period t equal to zero to infinity, beta to the t, natural log of ct. Sorry, I guess uh, let me make my notation consistent with what's up there. That would be consistent notation there, beta t minus one. So if you wrote that sum out, you would get exactly what's up above. All right, so what I want to do is use our intuition from the previous part where we just had a three period problem. And note that when I start from here on out, I just have another two period problem. So when it was three periods, we had noted we could write this beta of V of one plus R times S one or S1 was my decision. And in fact, we can do that for the infinite period problem. No, nothing is going to change. So I could take the infinite period problem, and I could write it as, and I'm going to write, if I start with some savings S0, that's like our A1, maximize my current consumption plus beta times V, and I'm going to start with 1 plus R times S1. This is subject to my current consumption plus S1 equal to S0. All right, so it's, it's a simple, very simple problem when written like that, right? So, I mean, there's, there's, it's actually not simple at all to, to fully understand this and understand what it is we're doing. But again... Relating back to that moving memento, all I'm trying to figure out is, of the resources I'm starting with, how much do I leave for my future self? And that future self is going to earn interest on that, and they're going to sail off into the future periods with a new amount, and we just restart, right? It's always a sequence of two-period problems. Now... We typically can't get really nice solutions like we did in, in the previous version, right? So I'm not going to be able to write down a complete formula for S1, generally speaking. There are some subcases that we might look at where we can solve these. But I want to just kind of analyze the problem a little bit. So one thing you have to do is, is to start and try to make some sense of what we've written here that I can write the problem as this two-period version, which if you work through the previous video, hopefully makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so how do I solve this? Well, I'm gonna take a similar path to what I did before. I'm gonna plug in for consumption. And so all I'm choosing is S1, natural log of S0 minus S1 plus beta V of 1 plus R times S1. So I can take first order conditions. With respect to S1, differentiate, I get minus 1 over S0 minus S1 plus beta and it will be V prime, sorry, it should be times S1, we've got a chain rule, beta times one plus R, 
v prime of 1 plus r times s1 equals 0. So, all right. So here's where it gets a bit tricky. Right, what is what is this v prime? Now, I could write the problem out, right? I mean, I could go up here and I could I could look at, okay, well, where is S1 going to show up there? And I could differentiate those terms with respect to S1. That would come to the same solution. What we're going to see here is that we don't actually have to do that. So what I can do is I can use the envelope theorem. Now, there's actually, you want to get really technical just to get a sense, right? So there's actually a sequence of theorems that you need first to, to show that the function v is actually differentiable. So it's never a given in these cases that the function is differentiable. There's a theorem called uh, benveniste Shankman theorem, which shows that the value function is actually differentiable. But that's a, a much more advanced uh, technical point. Uh, you won't need that in, until you're there. So I can use the envelope theorem that says... I could take v prime of, let's say, s0, and I just have to differentiate with respect to s0, which is just, well, it's 1 over s0 minus s1, right? And so what I can do is I can plug in a different value there, right? So this is for any period, or for any S0. And what I'm going to find is that if I plug in V prime of 1 plus R times S1 for S0, and I have to update this, it should be 1 over 1 plus R times S1, that's minus 0, minus the updated choice of savings would be S2. So I can just plug in a new value and update the V prime. Now, if I plug this in up here, I have my first order condition as minus 1 over S0 minus S1 plus beta times 1 plus R times 1 over 1 plus R S1 minus S2 equals 0. If I simplify that, I have 1 over S0 minus S1 with a beta times 1 plus R over 1 plus R S1 minus S2. And so, you know, I could go ahead and I could solve that for, let's say, S1, right? Now, that's not going to get me too far because I'm going to have to figure out S2. S2 is going to depend on S3 figure out S3, it's going to depend on S4, we'd be going for a long time, right? One way I can kind of simplify this is to notice this is C1, this was C2. So what does my condition tell me? It says that 1 over C1 is equal to beta, that's 1 plus R, over C2. If you go back and look, this is the exact same first order condition that we had in our three period problem. And in fact, our two period. Right, so th this is a really important idea that I can write any length of dynamic problem as effectively a two-period problem and get the key insights, right? So this tells me something about how I manage my consumption over time, right? It's, again, just a marginal rate of substitution equal to a relative price. So if I wanted to write that more generally, I have U prime of C1 is equal to beta times 1 plus R U prime of C2. 
So it's equating marginal utilities, right? Or marginal rates of substitution and relative prices. And no matter how many periods we write down the problem, every two periods, it's going to look exactly like this. And so the, the main point that we want to understand from all of this, it's going to take a little bit of work to fully understand this, is that we can write... infinite period problems as a two-period problem. Now, that's not always going to be true. There's only certain cases in which it is going to be true, but one way to say what we've done to some terminology we have written the problem recursively. So it's going to be a function of today and tomorrow. We're effectively taking time out of it, right? It's just a two-period problem over and over again. And so this thing Well, yeah, we'll leave it like this. This thing here, a lot of different names for it, technical name is this is a functional equation. So it's an equation where what we're trying to find is the function v. So this is also called a Bellman equation, named after the, as we talked about before, Richard Bellman, who was one of the first people credited with developing this idea. Okay, so we can also call V a value function. All right, so what do I want you to take from this? It's not just a bunch of names, right? You can call it whatever you want. Functional equation, Bellman equation, value function. You can call it V. You can call it whatever you want. That part doesn't really matter, right? So what does matter is to get some understanding. And we have, you know, I can turn any period problem into a two-period problem. And this is related to a concept called the principle of optimality. Now, generally speaking, that, that's a technical uh, result. Um, maybe we'll, we'll get into some of those technicalities. But the main idea is that of this is that what happened in the past doesn't matter. Right? And that's pretty intuitive, right? So I wake up today and I have some money. Whatever happened in the past doesn't affect my decisions going forward. I'm going to make those decisions optimally given what I have now. And so when I take that logic forward, it says, well, I'm always just faced with a two-period problem. What do I leave? What do I want to leave myself tomorrow? Right? And I know that tomorrow I'm going to make the optimal decisions. Makes it a two-period problem. Now, it's important to remember that it's not a two-period problem in the sense that I, I'm going to, to be gone tomorrow, right? And that I'm only going to decide how to manage my money over the next two periods. No, V captures the fact that I may live for a long time. And so what I'm really deciding is how much to consume today and how much to leave for my future self. And my future self doesn't have to worry about what I did in the past. They just decide optimally how to manage the future. And so that is 
a very quick overview of how we handle these problems. I'm going to go back over this on Monday and we'll do another example of a simple economic growth model. that we can use to apply these ideas and actually uh, get a few economic insights along the way. So, a couple quick points. This stuff is very difficult. So, it's called dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is, is a beast. It's a um, very technical subject and we haven't covered any of the technical details yet. But we've covered a little bit to get this kind of the basic idea. So there's a lot of theorems and other results that we need to make sure that this all actually works. And I haven't really shown any of that, and, and we won't. Um, so don't beat yourself up too much if you're, you're head spinning a fair amount at this point, right? So I just want you to kind of work through that previous example, spend a little time trying to think about this thing here, and how it is relating and how it's working and how this is gonna, going to work itself out. So we'll, we'll be back with more on Monday. Hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you soon.